three levels of sampling from beginner to pro production. First, let's talk about what makes a good sample and how to find what you need quicker. When you're digging for a sample, it's good to have knowledge of genres, decades, and keywords. Knowing the difference between a Yang Chin and a Western Zither will result in different styles and key signatures despite them being similar instruments. If you're looking for a funky bass line, having a knowledge of the decade that bands were pushing drum and bass solos is going to speed up the detective work too. But what makes a bad sample, you ask? Of course, a lot will rely on taste, but in my opinion, finding an overly compressed or noisy sample will make your job as a producer even more hard. Take this track for instance. A wonderful song, but the general level is consistent throughout. So it's going to be tough to find any chops in here compared to a sample that has a variety of dynamics. The same can be said for busy samples. When we get to the advanced stages of flipping a sample later in the video, I'll show you techniques which can reduce or fix busy samples. But if you're just starting out, finding a sample with too many instruments or vocals without a break is going to really slow you down despite how good the song sounds. And there's a key point to remember. You are making a song and you're looking for a sample. You're not necessarily looking for a completely full sounding song. Before we get into a variety of ways that we can make changes or contour to sample, get familiar with your tools at hand and find a workflow you like. Some folks like to use a drum rack, others use a synth sampler, there are producers that chop on the grid, and of course there's hardware samplers too. With each of these tools, I get a different result, so knowing where I work best for each kind of sample is really crucial. Let's get to the three levels of sampling starting now with the basics. Let me know if this was the type of video you were looking for today by dropping a like or giving me your opinion in the comments below. First off, we need to track down a sample and in this episode, I'm going to use Tracklib. It's quickly become my favorite place to dig for gold and we can use Tracklib to show the fundamentals and most basic ways of manipulating a sample. So over at Tracklib, we're gonna to go to new arrivals and let's just look at the first sample. So it looks like we've got a Seco by Tony Allen. Down here in the bottom right, we have three tools. Let's start with the first two, pitch and tempo plus the size of the loop. Choosing a two or four bar loop might be the difference between a banger and something that misses the mark. There's just too much here. But if we do one bar, that works from the get go. Let's see what else we got. That could be a great house sample. A little drum fill at the end there, that's great. And let's pitch this down. When pitching something down while slowing down the tempo, it'll introduce more bass and mud. But if we pitch that up, we introduce more brightness and sibilance. So it's a real balancing act choosing something that sits in the right sonic space. Think about pairing. What you're combining with a sample is also going to change the vibe of that sound as well. Inside Tracklib, we can pair our sample with drums to see what would be the best fit and how it would affect the vibe of the sample. That feels a bit busy because the drums are awfully similar. So let's try an early house beat. Outside of track lib and inside your door, having knowledge of relative minor and major keys can switch the vibe completely. Something we'll circle back to later is also combining this with other sample chops and what to look out for. Let's find a new sample and let's drag this into our software. And let's talk about the basics of chops. 
There are so many ways to chop a sample and at the basic level, finding the stabs or sections that make the most sense as a chord progression or groove is gonna be really helpful. Playing a sample in from left to right on your keyboard is only gonna sound as good as the sample source. But playing the sample out of order and switching up the rhythm gives it brand new life. Now, you can imagine that if you combine this technique with effects, you'll also generate different results. So let's talk about that too. Applying things like reverb, delay, pitch shift, or a chorus can all have an effect on the sample. We're now changing the perspective of that sound to something brighter, darker, wider, or its perceived distance to the listener. We'll come back to more effects in just a little bit. Another great way to chop a sample that takes very little brain power is to slice to new MIDI track. It will ask you how many slices you wanna create per beat marker. I normally leave it on quarter notes. At first, this break will play in order. But after clicking in the piano roll, you can start to edit these slices, change the position and edit how long these slices play for. This will help you come up with new rhythms that you might otherwise not have thought of. All right, so we're getting to the intermediate levels now. Let's look at side chaining. Giving your sample a ducking effect does not only exaggerate a bouncy groove, but it can also act as a helpful mixing tool to carve out space in your mix for other instruments or samples, or ensure that your kick and bass hits even harder. Again, it's great that we have this as an option from the jump inside track clip. So we get this ducking option, which is essentially side chain. And if we set that to hard, you get that real kind of Catronada vibe. Without. Everything's a little bit too close. The inverse can be applied when using a noise gate. I love this effect, but it's not used half as much as I'd like to hear it. But it's an awesome technique that you can use to punch a sample into the mix at random points using a chosen source instrument. The right sample tied to a kick can be a tremendous way to inject sample stabs into a mix. This works great with a mud pie. It's kind of the word we use for a really long sample of just weird sound design choices. Have you ever thought about using a vocoder or maybe a spectral resonator? I use the vocoder all the time to enhance the peaks of a drum sample or have something sound brighter. But using a spectral resonator is something different altogether. Here we're redistributing the harmonics based on the sample source. And with modern DAWs, you can give the resonator a rule so it stays in key with your track. I wanna talk about the filter effect. I love this method, it changes the vibe completely. Using a filter or an EQ and automating a sweet low or high pass can give you a very futuristic sound and it works great as a B section to your sample flip. Auto-tune. Yes, you can add auto-tune to anything, not just vocals. About six years ago, I heard this example in the outro to a James Blake track, which I think was called If the Car Beside You Moves Ahead. In the outro, the piano is auto-tuned, switching the notes as they glide from pitch to pitch. It's really weird and gives this kind of dissonant feel. Don't sit on beat repeats or arpeggios either. Fred again utilized the arpeggio effect on a recent piece of work he did and folks went wild for it. It's a great way to think outside the box and leave the sample chop to chance and randomize those choices. And 
if you want your sample to sound more in keeping with a certain decade, you can get creative with sound design or just use one of the tools at my Patreon. Here I have the Swerve device, which is applying a little bit of bit crush, vibrato and pitch wobble and filtering to make the sample sound less polished, therefore older and more degraded. You may have heard of Arcade and there's many plugins like it, which is a wonderful tool to rework your samples, but you can do this for free by hand as well. Reverse, change the pitch and stutter some of your samples, then consolidate those moments into one long sample. Now, as you chop up your samples, like in part one, in the basic section of the video, you suddenly have different results you wouldn't have been able to do with the original sample just by playing it out on the sampler. This next part differs greatly from sample to sample, but it's my favorite for noise and pads when pairing with a really long reverb. It's the tremolo. Let's grab a pad from Tracklib. All right, we're gonna drag this in and grab the tremolo. We're now gonna automate the rate from high to low on each chord change. How cool is that? It's basically every cyberpunk style trailer, but it does have this really futuristic alien sound. All right, so we're getting to the advanced techniques now. Time and pitch or tape slow. Using a plugin like Cable Guy's Halftime or just by knowing your way around a tape delay means you can create those cool tape slow effects heard in a lot of drill and trap. <laughs> I also want to talk about isolating an audio cleaner. Using a tool like Isotope RX can be a great way to clean up noisy or low quality samples, but using a site like Lalau AI can be a terrific way for isolating parts of a sample that doesn't have the stems available. Mm. When you are looking for vocal chops, you want to keep an ear out for vowel sounds. More often than not, you're going to be using U, E and R sounds over the sibilant consonants. Bear that in mind, hopefully that helps. Let's take a look at a more advanced level of sample chopping that was made famous by Jay Diller. Listen to this sample, which is actually in 3-4. One, two, three, one, two, three, Instead of playing this sample in as it's heard, one, two, three, one, two, three, try to play at a faster speed as 4-4. Four, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Putting the snare on the third beat, you now get a completely different groove. All right, strap in for the most mind-blowing chopping method. I forget about this one often, and it's something I picked up from Mr. Bill, so shouts to you, buddy. At the bottom here, I have quite a mundane beat. And at the top here, I have a sound design mud pie. By dragging that to a new MIDI clip, I'll be creating a simpler instrument. Right clicking that, I can create a sampler. I'm going to come over to MIDI, select Velocity, and choose Sample Offset, and then set that to 100. We now want to randomize this sample by choosing one MIDI note. Shift Command M, and then choose one long legato note. Right now, the sample won't randomize. But if we select an arpeggiator and a velocity tool, we can set the velocity tool to random, and maybe increase the rate to 24, increase the steps for pitch, 
and reduce the gate if you want more or less of the sample to be heard. Let's see what that sounds like with our drums. Of course you can audition new sounds by just dragging in a new sample. Now from here, there's another granular technique that is just terrific with an actual granulator. We're gonna use the Granny 3 inside Ableton, but use whatever of your choice. It's the most destructive way you can manipulate a sample and the results are different almost every time from producer to producer. It's a great way to create new ambiences for your track, but it's also a wonderful way to find new rhythms that you probably wouldn't have thought about by playing it in by hand. So here I have a short excerpt of an Indian vocal. And I'm just gonna reverse that. And then go Shift Command T to grab a new MIDI instrument and drag in the Granulator 3. I'll drag that sample into the Granulator 3 and add a nice long reverb to that Granulator as well. Adding a long MIDI note at C3 will start to play the sample through. <laughs> Setting your granulator to loop whilst experimenting with position, scan, and grain size, whilst resampling onto a new track will give you new ideas for this sample. And then throw that onto a new MIDI track in which you can chop it by beat regions. Using AI tools can be super handy as well. Utilizing a website like Suno or Udio can give you reimagined samples that don't currently exist, or at least a great reference tool for samples or loops that you could recreate yourself. So I'm gonna ask for a dark synth wave track with a groovy bass line. Okay, let's see what we got. And let's see the second one. This gives me a great template to start a song of my own. I'm thinking about doing another video on how you can use helpful AI tools. And if that's something that you wanna see in terms of creating samples, let me know in the comments below. Earlier in the video, I spoke of pairing samples as well. If you've ever visited whosample.com, you'll recognize that some artists and producers pair multiple samples in one song. So how do you go about doing this? In an Ableton project, I like to create a template where I can audition multiple one-shot kits with plugins and synthesizers and a selection of samples that I've downloaded that day. It's here we can get a basic idea of what works together before sending it to the last chain in which we chop up the samples. When I'm thinking about pairing samples, I try to imagine what's going to take up the low frequencies, what will be heard in the mid-band frequencies, and what will take up space in a more treble-focused area. I think lastly, I wanna talk about converting to MIDI. This is God mode level sampling, and you'll never know if a producer has utilized this technique. Okay, so we've got this sample inside Tracklib, and it says that the key is C sharp. We're gonna download this. And inside our software, we can convert this to a new harmony track. It's not always perfect, but by turning on the scale and then choosing fold, we can see and potentially delete the notes that shouldn't be in the scale. From here, we can quantize this chord progression if we like and really make it our own. I'm gonna add some extra notes from this B here. And I'm gonna copy and paste them to a higher octave as well. It's a great way to make a start on using a sample, but completely making it your own with extended chords or just different instruments. This is how a lot of producers in the late 90s and early 2000s got around copyright. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This was absolutely everything I could think to include about manipulating and flipping samples. Speaking of sampling, check out this outro made by 
legend community member John O.N. The sample was taken from Tracklib and completely manipulated, and I think it's the perfect addition to inspire by. Let Jono and I know in the comments whether you think it should be the staple outro to the show. We've never changed it in the history of inspire by. Thank you so much for swinging by, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll catch you next time. That's, that if you wanna, you